Hello and good evening everyone. Welcome to our 61st Blue Health Virtual Seminar. Blue Health Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows healthcare professionals to discuss current management updates of different health-related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge and preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Yenot Adela, a general physician and first aid trainer from Blue Heads Ethiopia. Today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Tadasa Gure here with us to have a seminar on basic obstetric ultrasound. Dr. Tadasa Gure is an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology, and he's also a maternal and fetal medicine subspecialist at Harman University. So, Dr. Tadasa, the stage is all yours. You can start. Hello, everyone. Good, good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Tadasa from Harman University. So, today's webinar will be on a basic obstetric ultrasound. So, this will be um, the basic of obstetrics uh, ultrasound, we don't go to the details of the obstetric ultrasound. So these are for beginners. Okay, so anyone interested to do obstetric ultrasound, this will be the eye opener for uh, anyone interested in obstetric ultrasound. So uh, the outline of uh, my presentation. So outline of my presentation will be, I'll talk on the principles of ultrasound, what's ultrasound, how does it work, and the six uh, standard uh, steps in obstetric, uh, basic obstetric ultrasound. So what's the fetal lie? How do you assess the fetal lie? Presentation, fetal cardiac activity, number of the fetus in the uterus, advocacy of the amniotic fluid, localization of the placenta, and the fetal uh, biometry. We'll look at it uh, uh, in this session. So, um, the first part will be about the principles of ultrasound. So as you know, uh, ultrasound is uh, a sound case okay, so, of uh, the sound that we have, the sound wave can be counted as the number of cycles per second, whether it's a, a 10 cycle per second or 100 cycle per second or 1000 cycle per second or 1 million cycle per second. Counts as a, a sound wave, and this uh, the SI unit of this sound wave will be hertz. Okay, so for example, if the frequency will, is um, twenty thousand, we will call it uh, twenty thousand uh, hertz. Or um, if it's twenty million, we, we call it twenty megahertz. So we um, wave of the ultrasound by up of waves, as you know, from the uh, topic of, or from the physics uh, session in high school. So uh, sound is a made up of waves that pass through the air to human ear. So you can see from below, uh, this um, uh, waves, how it goes, okay, this is a normal wave that we can able to hear. If the frequency of this wave is very fast, okay, or if it's very uh, slow, uh, human ear cannot um, hear this type of sound. So this type of sound can be heard or can be interpreted by ultrasound. So this, this is a normal that we can hear or audible by our uh, own ear, but this one is highly frequent that we cannot hear by uh, our um, uh, ear. But this one is very slow wave that we cannot hear um, with um, our ear. So ultrasound is a sound wave of frequency of greater than human ear that can uh, appreciate, especially human ear can uh, hear if the um, frequency is less than 20,000 cycles per second. But if it's more than 20,000 cycles per second, our ear cannot hear. So the ultrasound can hear it. And for diagnostic purposes, you know, with UN, we uh, use the ultrasound right and the left, you know, obstetrics and in gynecology, both, uh, both of them. And commonly we use 
2 to uh, 12 megahertz, that means 20 up to 12 million hertz, uh, we use for the diagnosis in obstetrics and the gynecology. And it has been uh, proposed uh, uh, to use in medical society or medical society for uh, decades. And it's safety, so well stated, uh, well stated, and that's said to be safe if it is properly uh, and used with indication. In obstetrics, uh, uh, ultrasound will, will help us in decreasing both maternal and the child mortality and mor morbidity. Okay, so for example, we use ultrasound for estimation of the fetal weight. If the estimation of fetal weight is more than, like, let's say it's five kg, so uh, we don't allow for labor and uh, delivery, so that we go for cesarean section and we prevent maternal mortality and the morbidity, as well as. Uh, for example, if you find the um, uh, IGR and um, we follow IGR by ultrasound, and if you uh, detect the Doppler affected Doppler, then we decide for delivery before the perinatal mortality or the stillbirth occurs. So generally, it decreases both the child and uh, the maternal morbidity and the mortality. So when we see, uh, uh, I'm sure that all of you know the ultrasound, have seen or used ultrasound. So we do have different parts of ultrasound. So uh, what you see here is the ultrasound probe, okay? And this ultrasound probe has different parts. And here, uh, it's uh, connected to the main part of the ultra, uh, probe that has uh, acoustic insulation. Then uh, um, from the main ultrasound, the electric um, uh, electrical activity will come to this area, and this what we call a uh, crystal. We call it piezoelectrical uh, crystal. The electric currency that came from the um, direct electrical or, or the, um, the ultrasound machine, it will be changed to sound by these piezoelectrical crystals. These piezoelectrical crystals will transmit the sound. So the electric current will be changed by the uh, to the sound by piezoelectric uh, crystals. Then the sound will be emitted, okay, like this one. Okay, the frequency of the sound will be different by the um, uh, different uh, uh, ultrasound probe. There are different ultra transvaginal, uh, convex, linear, cardiac, there are different types of uh, ultrasound probe. All these different types of ultrasound are different in uh, frequency. There are also other differences, but the main difference is the frequency. Um, so the frequency that will be released uh, from this probe will, okay, released from the piezoelectric will be uh, transmitted to the human body. After transmitting to the human body, so there will be a reflection of the uh, the sound, what we call it echo, um, uh, from the the lesson you have from the physics. So we call it echo. The ref reflection of the sound will be echo. So we do have different echoes, based on the echo or the reflected uh, echo. We can say this is uh, air, this is a bone, this is a soft tissue, this is a fluid. Okay, based on the what we have from the echo. So if you see the so the frequency that's transmitted or the ultrasound frequency that's transmitted from the through the fluid, all of them will pass. So there's no reflection. So we'll have a dark color or black color. So there's no reflection in a fluid. It will be reflected back. Okay, or the reflected back. So we'll have reflection or the ecogenic. Okay, we'll see later what's ecogenic mean. And in soft tissue, some of the wave will be transmitted to the soft tissue. Some of them will come back, um, uh, reflected back. So based on this reflection or the echoes, we can say this is a soft tissue, this is a bone, this is a air, uh, like that. Okay, so when ultrasound wave travels through the homogeneous medium, the path will be straight. So there's no difference in ecogenicity. But if the, uh, the wave travels through the different media, the reflection of the media will be different so that you'll have different ecogenicity, okay? Um, for example, so if uh, the echo is strong or the reflection like bone and air, the, all the uh, waves will be reflected back. So we call it hyperechoic, okay? They will have this color type. And when they have similar echo or like soft tissue, some passed and some reflected, 
okay, uh, equally reflected in the past. So we call it isoechoic, okay, isoechoic. And uh, some soft tissues will have more fluid inside them, then majority of the wave will pass through it, but some of them will be reflected. So a little bit dark than the isoechoic one, but still there is a reflection. So we'll have this type of color. In anoeco is that there's nothing to be ref reflected back or um, eco, there's no eco. So all the waves will be transmitted or passed through the media. So they will have a dark uh, color. Okay, so by this mechanism, we can say this is a bone, this is a soft tissue, this is a fluid. Okay, we can differentiate by this one. Okay, this is very important when we see ultrasound. Um, as a beginner, when we see ultrasound, this is very important, okay? So with it is um, based on the reflection, this is a fluid, this is a soft tissue, and this is a uh, echo, like that. For example, when we see uh, in obstetrics, when we see uh, placenta, we can see uh, different ecogenicity for to say there's a hematoma behind the placenta or not, okay? So it's very important and basic to know this uh, reflection of the echo. For example, this uh, um, this ovarian cyst, and this also ovarian cyst. The difference between this is this one is the whole the whole echo or the the whole um, wave passed through this one. But, but here, the, it's it's a little bit different than this one uh, because there's a debris inside it. Okay, because the debris and him uh, cloth inside it, there's some wave are reflected back because of cloth and because of the debris. So uh, even though both of them are varances, they do have different uh, ecogenicity. Here um, also you can see it is the same uh, ovary, anechoic okay, area. And this here, uh, uh, you can see hypoechoic area. And here you can see ecogenic or hypoechoic area. So this is very important. For example, if you find this uh, uh, thing inside the ovary, you can see this, this, this high chance of malignancy in this ovary. Here, um, the, there's a low chance of uh, uh, being malignant in this ovarian cyst. Here, you can say this may be abscess or um, hematoma, or there's something debris inside it, so or um, uh, mucinous uh, uh, tumor inside the ovarian cyst. So by just looking at the uh, ecogenicity, you can say this is um, uh, ecogenic and hypergenic and like that. Okay, So that you can narrow your differential diagnosis by using this uh, uh, one. So uh, this is a principle of ultrasound. So this is very important for a beginner to know uh, about the ultrasound. And when we come to the basics of ultrasound, as I've said earlier, we are going to mention or we are going to discuss only the basic or the beginning of this um, uh, ultrasound so that everyone can have a uh, view about the obstetric ultrasound. Um, or it can be done by anyone who has who is interested in doing uh, obstetric ultrasound. So obstetric ultrasound is fundamental of ANC. Okay, so every woman who is uh, following ANC or who is having uh, ANC should have at least two ultrasound examination during her pregnancy stay. Okay, so it's very important for ANC and. The basic is it's, it can help us to confirm gestational age and the viability. As you know, especially if you are working in countryside of Ethiopia, majority of our mothers, they don't know their LNP. So confirmation of gestational age is very important. Um, um, for for example, to say post-term pregnancy and um, uh, to avoid preterm intervention. So confirmation of uh, uh, gestational age is very important. And viability test also uh, very important. And we can also um, use ultrasound to detect congenital anomalies, okay? Congenital anomalies can be detected by ultrasound, especially in early gestational age, first trimester and early second trimester. If you find none um, uh, compatible of, uh, um, or any congenital anomalies that's not compatible with life, you can terminate the pregnancy be be before she goes to the uh, um, third trimester pregnancy. 
can see in the before the other complications of the obstetrics like antipartal hemorrhage, postpartal hemorrhage. You can detect um, anencephaly at nine weeks of gestational age, 10 weeks of gestational age, and you can terminate the pregnancy before it's, uh, it goes um, uh, higher. And also, uh, the different uh, abnormalities like um, uh, features of Down syndrome, features of the, uh, trisomy 18, and other anomalies can be detected as early as possible, and um, so that intervention can happen. And for example, you can, um, uh, in our country, it's not um, yet started, but you can diagnose um, congenital down hernia, and you do intervention. Uh, in trial so that you can prevent the disease of the fetus, and you detect um, um, meningomyocele. In Western, they do in try uh, repair of the meningomyocele so that they can decrease the morbidity. So it's very important in detection of the uh, abnormality of the fetus. Okay, you can also detect uh, assess the amniotic fluid volume. Okay, both polyhydramnos and oligohydramnos has. Um, a risk of uh, mor morbidity and mortality on uh, fetus. So, uh, as seen, the amniotic fluid volume is very important, and placental localization also very important. Okay, placental localization uh, it can be um, uh, placenta previa, so that it, we should rule out um, as early as possible and prevent uh, bleeding and days of uh, the fetus and days of the mother. Ultrasound also, it's not only for us seeing. Uh, uh, diagnostic uh, modality, but it can also help us for therapeutic uh, procedures. Okay, for example, we do intrauterine transfusion. Okay, when we do intrauterine transfusion, ultrasound will guide us when where to insert our needle, um, the, where to uh, transfuse uh, uh, the baby. So, uh, uh, not only intrauterine transfusion. For example, in the um, uh, intrauterine repair of the meningomyelitis cell, okay, uh, intrauterine uh, uh, ballooning of the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So ultrasound will help us. So ultrasound is very important, not only diagnostics, but also very important in therapeutic uh, uh, procedures. Generally, obstetrical ultrasound, we can classify them into three, specialized or targeted obstetrical ultrasound and limited obstetrical ultrasound. Standard obstetrical ultrasound is um, uh, what we have, what we are going to uh, discuss now, plus assessing for anomalies, okay? Anomalies um, uh, is, is involved in the standard uh, obstetric um, ultrasound. And the specialized is, um, Anatomical scanning, okay, this is what you call first time cell scan. First time cell scan will be scanned between 30, 11 weeks plus, uh, uh, 11 weeks up to 30 plus 6 a day. Um, in that session, where there, there are different things that we scan, like neural uh, nuclear translucency and the other congenital anomalies can be scanned at the um, first time cell, that means 11 to 30 weeks plus 6 a day. And there's also what you call second trimester uh, anatomical scanning. Between 80 to 22 weeks of gestation age, we do anatomical scan, okay? So, so that to, to rule out any um, anomalies or any congenital anomalies, whether it's uh, um, compatible or incompatible with life. So we can assess um, with a specialized or targeted ultrasound. Limited ultrasound is like, for example, if uh, you want to look for the amniotic um, volume, you don't you don't have to look up to uh, anatomy, you don't have to look at uh, placenta location because she already has it. So you just look at the uh, amniotic fluid and you you go this uh, the types of obstetric ultrasound. And um, when we see the obstetric ultrasound compared to the other types of ultrasound, okay, like um, abdominal ultrasound. Um, um, other chest ultrasound, adult ultrasound, it, it has inherent difficulty than the other uh, ultrasound types because of the one it's operator dependent. Okay, so the operator should be uh, confident in it, in knowledge wise and the technical wise to do obstetric ultrasound. And the second one is the complex fetal organ anatomy. Okay, so uh, the fetal organ. As you know, it changes uh, from time to time. What you see at uh, uh, 11 weeks, it will be different at uh, 16 weeks, it will be different at uh, uh, 26 weeks. So there's a complex or fetal organ anatomy. This because it's developing, it's not static. So, so that um, 
this may make a difficulty of uh, obstetric ultrasound. The other is some um, fetal movement. Okay, when you try to do obstetric ultrasound, the fetus may move. Okay, frequently so that you will not um, uh, get some uh, appropriate uh, organ timely so that you can you, you may not um, diagnose very well. So that's one of the inherent difficulty of obstetric ultrasound. The other is shadowing of target anatomical region. For example, in fetal echocardiography, okay, the chest rib of the fetus may um, uh, shadow the fetal uh, uh, heart so that the view of the um, fetal um, cardiac or the fetal heart will be difficult to, to do fetal echocardiography so that you should wait until the um, shadowing of the target um, the shadowing of the target organ uh, removed from the um, uh, from the target organ. The other is a uh, maternal body habitus. Okay, um, actually, in in our country, the rate of obesity is not as, as such high, but obesity is one of the uh, uh, problem in obstetric ultrasound examination. Exam for example, anatomical scanning may be um, difficult in obese women because of the obesity will obscure the or shad increase the shadowing of the uh, examination. So um, we, we we are going to see the sixth step or stepwise approach to the basic obstetric ultrasound examination in second and third trimester of pregnancy. Okay, so this is. Um, uh, this approach is primarily intended for out relatively easy, easy, to, uh, easy to learn, and they do not require sophisticated equipment. Okay, so there are different ultrasounds. You can do what, what, what type of ultra, what, and you refer to the highest pregnancy either the uh, obstetrician or the, um, if you if you have access to the maternal fetal medicine subspecialist, you can send her to maternal fetal medicine subspecialist. Um, a basic obstetric ultrasound. One that we can assess is um, uh, the fetal lie in the presentation. Other is fetal cardiac activity other number of the fetus in the uterus. The fourth is adequacy of the amniotic fluid. The fifth is localization of the placenta. And the sixth and the last one is fetal biometry. So we'll go, we are, we are going to look at each of the steps that anyone with ultrasound knowledge can do it after um, this training. So the first thing is um, fetal lie and the presentation. So as you know, fetal lie is, lie is defined as the longitudinal axis of the fetus in regard to the maternal longitudinal axis, we call it fetal lie. And as you know, fetal lie can be longitudinal, transverse, oblique, and sometimes we call it unstable lie. So how do we assess the fetal lie? We'll, uh, we'll see later. And the other is presentation. Presentation is, as you know, the fetal presentation is the fetal part that occupies the lowest part of the uterine cavity, cephalic presentation. It can be bridge presentation. It can be shoulder presentation and like that. Okay, so how we assess this one? Okay, by using the um, uh, ultrasound. So to assess the light, the first thing is you, you, you should imagine the longitudinal axis zone and you try to assess or you try to find the mid-sagittal plane of the fetal spine. This is a fetal spine. Okay, longitudinal, we, we do have, we do have a, a mid-sagittal, parasagittal and the coronal plane. So this is a mid-sagittal um, fetal spine. After looking at mid-sagittal fetal spine, is this mid-sagittal fetal spine, is it as the fundal part? Conversely, or is it going down horizontally or the vertically? Okay, so you look this spine in regard to the maternal um, axis, so so that you can say this is a longitudinal or this is a transverse or the, this is oblique. 
if the fetal mesagittal fetal spine is 180 degree to the maternal axis, we call it longitudinal line. If it's 90 degree to the maternal axis, we call it um, transverse line. If it's uh, 45 degree to the maternal axis, we call it um, uh, uh, oblique line. This is how we assess the line of the fetal. So, and um, uh, after we checked for the line, then we go assess to the fetal uh, presentation. Okay, to assess the presentation, you should play the, place the transverse transversely in the lower abdomen, just above the simple surface, and um, angle inferiorly. Okay, so uh, you put the um, probe transversely at the simple surface, and you, okay, at the simple surface, then you change the probe, okay, inferiorly, okay, or you face the probe inferiorly. Then after facing the inferiorly, you look for the head or the buttock, okay? So by putting this one transversely, okay, this umbilicus, this is a fundus of the um, uterus, this umbilicus, as you can see, this is a symphysis pubis. So transversely, you put the um, probe as a symphysis up just above the symphysis pubis and face inferiorly. If you find the head like this one, we say it's a, a cephalic presentation. If you put similarly and you see this um, uh, uh, the buttock of the uh, the fetus, this um, iliac spine, iliac spine and, uh, iliac of the iliac of the fetus. So if you find this one, you can say this is a bridge presentation. Okay, and sometimes you may not find anything here. Okay, you put transversely and you face inferiorly, but there's nothing here. So if you didn't find anything here, that means as the fetus is okay, transverse line, okay, so that the baby is, uh, you can't see anything in the uh, lower part of the um, uh, uterus, okay? Okay, so if um, you didn't find cephalic or bridge, then we should assess for the fetal line because there may be uh, transverse line. Okay, so this is how we assess the fetal lie in the presentation. So the first step in a basic obstetrical ultrasound that anyone can do is assessing the fetal lie in the presentation. This is very important. For example, if you find transverse lie at seven weeks of gestational age or bridge presentation at seven weeks of gestational age, okay, she needs some uh, intervention like external cephalic version or if she came in labor and you find transverse lie or bridge presentation, okay, you may go ahead for season answer. So knowing the fetal lie and the presentation is very important. The second part of this uh, basic uh, uh, fetal, basic obstetric ultrasound is fetal cardiac activity. Okay, fetal cardiac activity can be assessed by three meters. Okay, one is just you can look at the um, heart Okay, so that you can look at the beating of the hair. Okay, so while the, the hair is beating, the other is color Doppler. Okay, you put a color Doppler over the heart and you can look, uh, you can see whether there's a color flow that shows that there's a um, cardiac activity, especially in in second trimester and third trimester. It may, it is very easy to find the cardiac activity, but in early gestation age, like six weeks, five weeks. So you can use uh, either color Doppler or you can use a uh, ME mode to assess the uh, cardiac activity. So this ME mode, so you put the um, ME mode, ME mode means motion mode, okay? So this uh, ME mode over the ventricle and uh, atrium so that the valve and this atrial contraction. So by this, by looking at this one, there's a contraction here. There's a change of um, uh, opening and closing of the valve. So you can see, you can see there's a uh, um, fetal cardiac activity. Okay. So to look for the uh, fetal cardiac activity, you place the transverse transverse in lower abdomen just above the like we 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 did earlier. Then slide superiorly in the mid abdomen towards the umbilicus. Okay. Um,
Okay, so you, you put as a synthesis proof is in a, sli a slide up or what to the level of the amplicus, then in majority of the cases, you will see the cardiac activity up to the uh, umbilicus. If you didn't visualize the cardiac activity up to the level of the umbilicus, then you go laterally, okay, to the, to the, towards the left side and the right side at the level of the umbilicus, okay, so, so that you can see uh, fetal cardiac activity. But in majority of the cases, you can detect um, by up to the, by moving up to the level of uh, mid abdomen or the, up, up to the level of the umbilicus. Okay, in um, okay, so in in in, uh, in this um, uh, case, you can see the um, uh, cardiac channel. Chambers, the four chamber cardiac view, okay, the uh, vent, right ventricle, right atrium, left ventricle, right, left uh, atrium, so that you can uh, say this um, uh, normal uh, beating. Okay. See here also, you can see contraction of the uh, uh, ventricle, okay, this is a contraction of the ventricle, this is a valve and the atrial contraction by MMO. mode. Okay, so the second step is a uh, cardiac. Uh, activity okay so in second third trimester it's usually easy but in the first trimester it may be a little bit difficult so you can use the color and um, emmy mode and um uh, you should go from the symphysis movies upward to up to the level of the umbilicus in the majority of the cases you can find the third step in the basic ultrasound is the number of uh, fetus okay so knowing the number of the fetus is very important indicating perinatal morbidity, mortality, and uh, maternal morbidity and mortality. And it's very important to diagnose um, the number of the fetus as early as possible. As a gestational age, because um, in early gestational age, you can, if you find twin pregnancy in early gestational age, you can easily determine the coronacity. That's very important for uh, um, uh, follow up and intervention, but if it's late, okay, you can still just count the number of the fetus, but it may be difficult to uh, know the coronacity in the late second, um, late trimesters. Okay, so how we know uh, how or how we can determine the number of the fetus? Okay, it depends on the mapping of the uterine cavity. Okay, by in a systematic and a standard way. Okay, and if you find more than one head, okay, you, you should confirm the presence of twins uh, by looking the other body of the other part of the fetus and the body of the fetus. And mapping of the uterus involves um, uh, scanning of the uterus in entirely both longitudinal and transverse approach. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, in transverse and um, sagittal, uh, sagittal orientation, here is just in transverse orientation, a right, like, right, you slide upward, okay? You slide upward up to the level of the fundus, okay? So you see uh, the uh, number of the heads that you can see here. What you shouldn't do is, um, here is, you shouldn't tilt the um, probe, okay? If you tilt the probe, okay, you, you, you may, see the same uh, head two times so that you can say this is twin pregnancy. So to avoid that, you start from one side, you go upward, then you go the, to the mid, you go upward, and you go to the left side and you go upward so that you can count the number of the head or the number of the fetus. So very important thing is you shouldn't tilt the ultrasound probe, okay? For example, if you find head here, and you come here, you tilt the probe of the ultrasound towards the uh, right side of the woman, then you find the same head, but you may diagnose as twin pregnancy. So avoid tilting the ultrasound probe during um, uh, looking for the number of the fetus. Okay, here. So you start from the right side and you go upward to the fundus. You do in the midline, you go upward, and left side, you go upward. So that you will uh, detect the number of uh, 
the head. If you find the num two or two or more body parts, okay. Okay, the other is um, it's not only the uh, horizontal thing that you do, okay. So in a uh, sagittal orientation also, so you start from the upper part of the uh, fundus, okay. You go from right side to the left side. Earlier we said from the lower to the upward, but now transversely you go from right to left, at the middle from right to left, and as well from right to left. Okay, by doing this one, you can detect the number of the fetus. Okay, here. Okay, one, two, or intermittent. You can use it. Okay, three also. If it is a large uh, uterus, so one, two, and three optionally. Okay. Um. So when the presence of second fetus is suspected, providing confirmation by identification of two separate bodies and the body membrane is. Uh, very important, okay? So, um, especially in uh, early trimesters, knowing the coherency, as you know, uh, when we see the twin complication or there are twin specific complications like twin twin transfusion syndrome, uh, twin reversal, um, um, uh, uh, twin reversal uh, arterial perfusion and twin uh, anemia and the polycythemia uh, syndrome. So this is common in monochronic twins, okay? so. Um, apart from the number of the fetus, the coronary is very important, very important in following the complications and the intervention um, for twin pregnancy. Okay, for, the, for example, here you can see two body parts of the fetus. It's early, early time, so, so it's very easy. And at the same time, you can see the separating membrane. Okay, the, the, this separating membrane shows that this direct amniotic. But when you see the thickness of the, um, there are different mechanisms that you can say this is uh, a uh, dichoronic or monochronic. So from um, uh, from this ultrasound, this is a monochronic. Here, the separating membrane is very thick. You, you can see two body parts, separating membrane is thick, and there's a placenta entrance into the uh, separating membrane. We can say this one is a, a dichoronic diagnostic. Here is monochronic diagnostic. Okay? So knowing the coronary is very important in twin pregnancies or multi pregnancy. The fourth um, important uh, parameter is that we should look for is the placenta localiz localization. Okay, the placenta can be located as a fundus or anteriorly or laterally, right lateral or left lateral or posteriorly, or it can be placenta previa. So, localization of the placenta is very important. One to rule out the um, placenta previa. Two, especially if you are going to do cesarean section, localization of the placenta is very important to avoid entrance into the placenta and the causing bleeding of uh, bleeding. Okay, so it's very important to localize. So how do we localize the placenta? Okay, um, we place the transgender in such that in the right upper column. Earlier, we start from the right lower column. So it should be in a vertical uh, orientation. It, should, it shouldn't be horizontal, okay? So you put vertically, and, and you go from, on the right side, from you go from upper to lower. You look for the placenta. And in the middle, you go from upper to the lower. And in the um, third one, you go from the um, upper to the lower, so that in majority of the cases, or in more than 99% of the cases, you can localize the placenta by this mechanism. Sometimes can, the placenta may be posterior, and it may be difficult to visualize with this world. Okay, you can visualize, but to characterize, it may be difficult. So you can, you can go laterally, and you put your probe horizontally, and you look from the side to, to look for the placenta, in, especially obese women, um, uh, and always in the pl posterior placenta. And once you diagnose, uh, once you put the location of the placenta, if the placenta in the lower uterine segment, then you should characterize or you should look for the placenta previa, or you should measure uh, whether it's um, really low lying or really away from the cervix, or uh, is it the placenta previa? Okay, the most 
diagnostic modality by this uh, the, of the placenta previa is transvaginal ultrasound. Even you can diagnose um, uh, placenta previa by abdominal probe in 95% of the cases, but in 100% of the cases, you can localize or you can uh, diagnose the placenta previa or perfectly, or you can measure the age of the placenta from the internal cervical os. Okay, so here, for example, here, this uh, fundus of the uterus. Okay. So the placenta is attached to the fundus of the uterus. So we call it this a fundal placenta. Here you can see this up. When you go posteriorly, there's nothing placenta here, but when you go anteriorly, there's a placenta here. So this is an anterior placenta. This is no placenta to characterize the edge of the placenta. Is it in here or is it covers up uh, cervical os is very important, okay? Here, um, these are right lateral uh, uterine wall. Okay, posteriorly we have on the other side of the uh, view, okay, we do have uh, left lateral uterine wall. So this placenta is on the right lateral so we call it right of another placenta or the placenta. So we call it left um, uh, side placenta, okay, or left side um, uptight placenta, okay. So by this mechanism, you can create earlier ultrasound imaging of the uterus from the lateral aspect of the abdomen for or laterally and you can do abdominal type of uh, ultrasound. In trans abdominal ultrasound, okay, this is a placenta uh, mass, uh, placenta, okay, and this is cervix, okay, the anterior uh, age or anterior uh, part of the cervix, and this is a posterior part of the cervix, the cervical canal. So the placenta is at the age of the cervix. So uh, in this case, okay, trans vaginal ultrasound is very important, okay, to really characterize the um, uh, location of the placenta, okay. This is how to localize the placenta. And the fifth important uh, parameter is uh, assessing the amniotic fluid volume, okay. As uh, you know, amniotic fluid volume is uh, very important because uh, oligo hydramnus and polyhydramnus has um, clinical value and uh, can increase the prenatal morbidity and mortality. So generally, how do I assess the amniotic uh, fluid volume? We can, there are uh, two ways of uh, seeing amniotic fluid, either by ultrasound and direct measurement of the uh, amniotic fluid. Direct measurement of amniotic fluid can be done by uh, during cesarean session, by doing hysterectomy, you collect all the amount of amniotic fluid and you measure. And the other is a, a di-dilutional test. Okay, so we don't do it in our country and it's um, uh, tiresome and uh, it's invasive test. So it's, it's not uh, recommended. So what's recommended is um, uh, assessing amniotic fluid by uh, ultrasound. By ultrasound, there are five methods of assessing um, uh, amniotic fluid. One is subjective assessment. Subjective means you just put the, pro the ultrasound probe and you look the um, fluid without measurement, you can say this adequate, or you can say this is scanty, or you can say um, uh, this um, MPT or uh, oligodermis, okay? And you, you can also say, just by looking without measurement, this is a huge amount of fluid, so that you can this, you can say this is a polyhydrate. This is subjective measurement. The second one is uh, single deepest pocket or uh, uh, maximal vertical pocket. Okay, maximum vertical pocket. Okay, in when we assess the um, amniotic fluid, we we put or we divide the abdomen into four four quadrants. Okay, by using the midline or the mid umbilicus and um, midline as umbilicus and uh, transverse as umbilicus, then we we measure from the four quadrants. From the four quadrants, the maximum one is we call it maximum vertical pocket. Okay, by using ma maximum vertical pocket or single deepest pocket. If it's between two to eight uh, centimeters, we say normal. If it's less than two centimeters, we say oligodamnos. And if it's more than eight centimeters, we say polyhydramnos. 
The other is uh, I'm not fluid index, the third one is I'm not fluid index. By I'm not fluid index, okay, so um, we measure from the four quadrant, okay, quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four, and we add together. By adding together, if it's between five to 25, we call it uh, normal amnot fluid volume. If it's less than five, we call it a uh, uh, oligohydramnos. And if it's more than 25, we call it polyhydramnos. Okay, and the, the uh, fourth metrics of assessment of the uh, amnot fluid uh, volume by ultrasound is two dimensional assessment. Two dimensional means you, you look for the largest pocket of the amniotic fluid and you measure the vertical and transverse, you multiply together. If it is between 15 centimeters to 50, okay, from one five centimeters square to five zero centimeters square, we say normal or adequate. And if it's um, less than one five centimeters square, we say oligo. If it's more than five zero centimeters square, we say polyhydramnos. The last or the fifth meters of assuming um, adequacy of the ultrasound by ultra, the, um, uh, adequacy of the fluid by ultrasound is uh, two by one or two by two technique. Two by one or two by two technique is if you find a single pocket measuring two centimeter by two centimeter or two centimeter by one centimeter, we can say adequate amniotic fluid. By this method, we cannot say oligo or poly, but we can say adequate amount of um, amniotic fluid. So how do we measure it? So mapping of the iterans is very important. Then we measure the greatest vertical damage with the ultrasound transfer in sagittal orientation and propagate follow. So here, okay, when you put the probe, what's very important is you should put in a sagittal orientation, that means um, uh, 180 degree to the maternal, and it should be perpendicular to the floor, okay? They should not be obliquing, um, making oblique of the transfer, or it shouldn't be transverse um, uh, transfer. Uh, transfer. So if you make it oblique, or um, uh, transverse, it's falsely increased the amniotic fluid or falsely decreased. So you should make sagittal orientation and perpendicular to flow. This is very important in, uh, point in uh, measurement of uh, amniotic fluid volume. Uh, here you can see, so to measure the um, single uh, vertical pocket or a pocket, the lateral dimension of the pocket should be at least one centimeter. Then you, you avoid extremities. There should not be extremity in the uh, measurable area. There should not be a cord in the measurable area. It should be a clear fluid. And the, the probe should be a sagittal orientation and perpendicular to the floor. So by that method, you measure a single uh, pocket. And this 1.56 centimeter, uh, that's oligodamnus. Here you can see 20.28 single tipped vertical pocket, that's a polyhydramnos, okay? So uh, commonly the error that um, uh, most of us do is uh, we, we put the transfer um, transversely or we put it um, obliquely. So the small fluid will make it larger, okay? So you should avoid making transverse and uh, making oblique, okay? It should be sagittal and perpendicular to the floor. That's very important. Okay, so after making um, sagittal, then you, you, you move from right to left or from left to right. Okay, so here it's a um, um, sagittal orientation and perpendicular to the floor. And you go from the right of the woman, this offenders, this umbilicals, this invisibles. So from the right of the woman's side, so you, you go to the left side. Then you go is here also. You start sagittally, um, in sagittal orientation, perpendicular to the floor. You go slowly from here to here. Then you look for the largest pocket in the four quadrants. This one quadrant, two quadrants, three quadrants, four quadrants. From this four quadrant, you look for the largest one. And you go measure in the largest one. That's a single deepest pocket. If you measure all of them, that's a... Um, Amnot fluid index. This is how we measure the amnot fluid volume. And the last part of this uh, basic obstetric uh, uh, ultrasound is fetal biometry. Okay, 
uh, biometry means as you as you know it's a measurement okay so measurement of the fetal body uh, to uh, to uh, to assess the gestational age as well as to estimate the fetal weight we we, we use the fetal biometries okay so in 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 the first trimester we have different parameters for example in early we can use the gestational sac measurement yolk sac measurement and crow ramp lemgas, which is the most um, uh, liable, uh, reliable measure, measurement for gestational age is crow lamp lengths. And later in early or late um, uh, first trimester or early second trimester, we can use bipartal diameter. Uh, then when you go higher, uh, you can use head circumference, bipartal diameter, abdominal circumference, and femoral lengths. So in second and third trimester, we use this for parameters. So this is a crown lap length in the first time itself. Okay, so this is a crown, okay, as you know, and uh, ramp is a um, buttock, okay. So uh, by this, of having this uh, mid-sagittal view of the baby, uh, avoiding hyperflexion, hyperextension, then you measure uh, by this method crown lamp length. This is for the first time itself. In second trimester, so the first measurement that we use is bipartal diameter. As you know, there's a two bar, we do have two parietal bones, okay? So bipartal means two parietal bones. So the distance or the diameter between the two parietal bones is, we call it bipartal diameter. And the bipartal diameter okay, measures gestational age with a variation of seven up to 10 days in the second trimester. Okay, so in uh, how do you measure the par bipartal diameter? Normally, we do have um, in a uh, uh, fetal sonography, uh, fetal uh, neurosonography, that means um, us using ultrasound for um, uh, central nervous system or the CNS study. So we do have two or uh, three um, uh, views, okay? So one is uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, trans thalamic, trans uh, uh, ventricular and uh, trans cerebral view in axial view. Okay, we do have axial view, we do have uh, mid sagittal view, parasagittal view, and coronal view. Okay, mid sagittal view, coronal view, and uh, axial view. On axial view, that means transverse view, we do have three views as I've said earlier trans ventricular, okay, where we can see the lateral ventricles for ventricular megaly or hydrocephalus. And transthalamic, where we can measure the bipartal diameter and the head circumference, and transcerebral, where we can where we can measure the cerebral diameter as the posterior fossa and like that. So this um, uh, transthalamic view, okay. In transthalamic view, this is a thalamus, okay. This is thalamus. This is a system nabazalis, okay. So here we do have thalamus. We do have thalamus. We call it transthalamic view. In transthalamic view, the first thing that we should see is the false cerebrae. The false cerebrae should be at the middle of the view, okay, at the middle of the view. And we should visualize the cavum septum pellucidum. Okay. And if there is discrepancy between the one part and the other part, okay, it, either there's a midline shift or the RV is not uh, right. Okay, having the midline false cerebrae. Cavern of Tampolusidum, Thalamus, okay, that's where we can measure the uh, bipartal diameter. Okay, bipartal diameter can be measured for, from, um, uh, there are different opinions, um, uh, uh, measuring from the outside to outside and measuring from the outside to the inside. We, in our country, we commonly use from the outside to the inside because um, because the shadowing of the posterior uh, calvarium can increase the diameter of the bipartal diameter so that we don't use the uh, posterior okay, uh, outside. But you can look to your ultrasound. Okay? There are ultrasound machines who can, which can use the outside to outside. So you can set it. If the set, the set is from the outside to the outside, you can use outside to outside. If it is um, from outside to the inside, so you put the, your um, caliber from the outside, then to the inside of the calvary. Okay, so that, that's a bipartal diameter. 
the perpendicular to the thalamus, okay, perpendicular to the thalamus. So this is how we, we measure the um, hair circumference, okay? So here you can look at the calvarium, the shape of the head, and the false cerebrum is at the middle. Um, here, the cavern septum pallidum. Um, here, the, there's a thalamus, here's thalamus, and um, cisterna basalis here. So we measure from the outside to the inside. Okay, this is a bipartal diameter. Okay, sometimes uh, you, you, you can see the uh, anterior horn and the posterior horn of the ventricle. So this is a ventricle, lateral ventricle. This um, uh, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle, you can see this is a choroid plexus. So um, we do have different views in uh, different trimesters, okay? So in the first trimester, in second trimester, in third trimester, okay, we do have different, for example, as I've said earlier, we do have three views in the axial view, transventricular, transthalamic, and transcerebral. Here it's different. That's uh, why I said earlier the fetal anatomy difference can make the um, uh, diagnostic challenges in obstetric ultrasound. So, transthalamic is in the early uh, first trimester or in the uh, late first trimester. So, you can see the thalamus here. In second trimester, you can see thalamus here. And third, you can see thalamus is this a transthalamic view. Transcerebral, okay, this is out of the topic of this um, uh, session, but you can see cerebellum here. This is a cerebellum, this is a posterior fossa. So uh, you, you should look at the posterior fossa. If there's an increment or large size of the posterior fossa, you can send to the maternal fetal medicine specialist and you can have a view um, uh, here in the third trimester with a vermis inside it. Okay. And the um, second um, biometer that we can use is head circumference. In head circumference also can be measured at the same site where we can measure the bipartal diameter. It's um, at the um, axial view of the transthalamic view. Okay, um, then an ellipse is placed around the edge of the skull, then circumferences will be uh, calculated. Okay, here, the same picture that we used earlier, this, um, okay, you can see the shape of the head, okay, all are visible, and this is um, uh, false cerebrum, it's the center of the um, head, and this is a cavern septum pollicidum, and this is a thalamus, this is a thalamus, this is a certain basalis, so you measure, okay, as the outside of the caliber should be measured, uh, put as the outside, anteriorly and posteriorly, then you can enlarge or decrease to measure the head circumference. Okay, the third um, biometer that we use in second third trimester is abdominal circumference. Abdominal circumference is very important parameter in uh, uh, fetal um, scanning because it's a very important in estimation of the fetal weight. So by using abdominal circumference only, you can say fetal growth restriction or IGR. So um, it should be measured Okay, correctly. Okay, so that otherwise it can cause either large for the future, large for, uh, uh, for gestational age baby or uh, fetal growth restriction. So it's mostly affected by the fetal growth and um, uh, for gestational age estimation, uh, abdominal circum has great variation and which it may reach up to two to three weeks in the second trimester. So to measure the abdominal circumference, circ is placed outside the fetal skin in transverse image. And the, there should be stomach, okay? So it should be at the transverse and just above the level of the insertion of the um, umbilical cord, okay? Here, the umbilical cord insertion is here. So above the umbilical cord insertion, without entering into the chest, we, we, we transversely put here. After we put transversely, we'll see, okay? We should see the spine here and aorta, on the left side, okay, posterior on the left side, stomach on the left side, and uh, inferior vena cava in front of the aorta, and uh, more on the right side, and we can see the convalence of the umbilical vein and the portal sinus. So by looking, if you look this one, and preferably having a single rib on both sides, okay, single rib on both sides, we can measure the abdominal circumference, okay. So here, 
um, it's not a good uh, picture because we do have multiple uh, ribs here. So as much as possible, it's preferable to have a single rib. Okay, so stomach is on the left side. Um, here, a rib is visible, the spine, and aorta on the left side and posteriorly, inferior vena cava on the right side and anteriorly, and this is a confluence of the um, umbilical vein and portal uh, vein and forming portal sinus. So this is an area where we can measure the abdominal circumference. Here also, okay, so um, this is spine here, and uh, this is a stomach on the left side. Um, this um, actually is not single rib. There are two ribs here. And um, this aorta, this um, uh, inferior vena cava on the uh, right side. And the confluence of the uh, umbilical vein and the portal sinus. So this is an area where we can, we should measure the abdominal circumference. Okay? Similarly. So, uh, the last part of the fetal biometry is um, femoral lingus. Okay. Uh, so femoral lingus uh, correlates well with the uh, bipartal diameter in the gestational age, and it's measured with a beam paprika to the long axis of the shaft. Okay. So you look for the shaft of the femur, and the beam should be perpendicular to the um, shaft of the uh, femur. And the calibers should be placed at each end of the calcified diaphysis. It should be put at the calcified diaphysis, and we should exclude epiphysis. The gestation estimation will be uh, with a variation of seven to 11 days in second trimester. Okay, so here this is a femoral femur, and you put the calibers at the ossified uh, diaphysis. Okay, this is ossified area, this ossified area. Here also, so this uh, uh, femur, and you put the caliber at the ossified area, uh, ossified area, avoiding the epiphysis. So this is all about the basic um, obstetric ultrasound. So uh, thank you very much. All right, uh, Dr. Tardesa, thank you very much. And participants, if you have any question, you can write down your questions in the chat box. In the chat box, Kebra Tagasa asked how to place and search for the organ during fetal biometry. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are many questions. I mentioned how to place and search for organ during fetal biometry. Um, or organs, so yeah. for uh, anatomical scanning is different uh, than biometry. This is a basic ultrasound evaluation. Okay, so for standard and targeted ultrasound examination, um, uh, you should have uh, another course of uh, uh, learning how to scan. So, so during uh, biometry, for example, in in, in head circ in head circumference or um, head assessment, we have different views. Okay, so we do have sagittal view, we do have transverse or axial view, we do have coronal view. So to assess the anatomy, so we use these three views in axial or transverse view, as we have seen earlier, we do have still three views of axial or transverse view. These are transthalamic, transventricular, uh, and transcerebellar view. Okay, so you can look at the, um, for example, at the head, you can look at the, uh, whether the ventricomegaly, if this is gross ventricomegaly during biometry measurements of the head, you can look at it and you can either refer for the um, uh, maternal fetal medicine specialist or uh, gynecologist, or if you are able to do it, okay, you can measure and which uh, ventricle is dilated and uh, uh, what is uh, where 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 shall um, uh, where to measure the level of the ventricle is very important. Okay, so it needs a, a detailed uh, course or detailed knowledge how to assess. Okay, easily you can look at the body. But to say this is a normal baby, okay, without anomaly, so you, you should have uh, training. For example, if you uh, uh, okay, easily, when you do um, uh, head circumference assessment, okay, so I'll go back. Okay. okay, so when you do head circumference or BPD, okay, so we say that we should look at the false cerebrae 
and carbon center polysodium and the thalamus. For example, if you didn't, if you couldn't see this um, uh, carbon center polysodium, that's a one of the findings that show us the absence of uh, uh, corpus callosum. Okay, so that has a chemical significance. So if you didn't find this uh, uh, carbon center polysodium, so you go ahead for the sagittal view of the same as we call it the fetal uh, neurosonography. So this uh, needs advanced training. So you can just look at it. And you couldn't, if you couldn't find this one, you can refer to the baby for anatomical scanning. Okay. So by basic, um, it may be difficult. And the other, you can, uh, for example, when you assess the abdominal circumference, uh, you, you can just look at the abdomen and you can look for ascites and like that. Okay. If you have ascites here, you can look at it. If there is any protruding mass from here, actually, we should look at the sagittal view. Um, so you can say either on follow cell or gastrochiasis. So during biometry, you can look at the body. But to say I'm normal, uh, we need to have uh, uh, detailed knowledge of the fetal anatomy and the knowledge of um, uh, uh, assessing or, or um, fetal body by ultrasound. A single patient for 30 to 40 minutes, okay? Um, uh, 30 minutes of average, uh, we do uh, anatomy. So it has no effect on the mother. It has no effect on the fetus. Um, but there are things that you should check, um, especially when we are doing color Doppler, Doppler um, ultrasound. Doppler ultrasound has a power. Okay, we should arrange the Doppler power of the ultrasound machine. Doppler ultrasound, the power that can cause a heat, we call thermal index and mechanical index. Both the thermal index and the mechanical index of the uh, um, ultrasound is posted over the uh, ultrasound machine. So you should look at the mechanical index and thermal index of your ultrasound machine. Both of the mechanical index and thermal index should be less than one. If it's more than one, it can cause heat trauma to the fetus. Okay, so um, in, in Doppler ultrasound, we should be careful. And according to Alara, okay, it should be then, ultrasound should be then on indication, upon indication only. It's not for corporatics, it's not for hobby, it's not for game. Ultrasound should be then only upon indication. So if you do it by indication, there's no harm, but Doppler has an harm on a fetus if it's not used properly. If it's used properly, there's no problem. Okay, uh, the other question is classification of um, amnot fluid volume by FI of polyadenos by FI. So uh, as I've said earlier, by FI, uh, we say normal or adequate if it's between five to 25. We say mild or grade one, if it's between 25 to 29.9, we call, we call it moderate, if it's between 30 to 34.9 or grade two. And if we say severe, if it's more than uh, 35, greater or equal to 35, we say severe. Uh, the, the other question is how we can find femur easily. Okay, so we put transverse or sagittal, uh, the transverse view of the abdomen, and we go downward up to we see the uh, uh, sacrum. Okay, up to up to the sacrum, we can go downward. Okay, here for example, we have abdominal circumference. Then when we slide, okay, so uh, after the abdominal circumference, when we sweep downward our probe, then we can see the sacrum. Then we can see the both femur, okay, both femur. And after finding both femur, you try to arrange your um, uh, perpendicularity or the arrangement of the sound beam, then it should be perpendicular to the, uh, the femur so that you can measure that time. You should make large, uh, you should enlarge the femur. After finding the femur, you should enlarge it and to feed the whole screen. Then you measure the you measure the ossified area of the um, uh, 
uh, female. Maybe if I miss other questions, I can uh, go and look at these are the questions that um, I got. Okay, uh, the other question, I, I diagnosis by Doppler. So, um, IGR is a, a, a definition as a, a dif different definitions. Okay, so uh, American uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology definition is depends mainly on, okay, solely on uh, measurement of the abdominal circumference and estimated for fetal weight. If less than 10 the percentile, they call it a, a, a IGR or fetal growth restriction. But according to the ICO or International Society of Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology, RCOG, um, uh, Fetal Medicine Foundation, uh, Barcelona, there are different institutions who use the combination of the uh, Doppler ultrasound as well as um, measurement of the fetal weight. So based on that, there are definitions. One is if the AC is or the estimated fetal weight is less than 30 percentile, that's a definition for fetal growth restriction or IGR. Or if the FGR and um, fetal weight is less than 10 percentile, we use another parameters. One is uterine artery pulse, uh, pulse index, okay, or PI measurement. If PI of the uterine artery is more than 90 percentile, that's one criteria or we use the umbilical artery PI index, okay? If the umbilical artery PI is more than nine feet, we use, okay, estimated fetal weight, plus either of the um, uh, uterine artery or umbilical artery. In late gestation, we use, um, uh, rather than the umbilical artery, we use major cerebral artery uh, PI and cerebroplacental uh, ratio, okay? So this may be out of, uh, out of the topic and maybe, um uh it's not a basic thing so that um so measurement of minister artery uh, pi and if it's less than 50 percentile or cerebral placental ratio of less than 50 percentile that's a diagnostic for um IGR, okay so we in um combination with the estimated fetal weight Okay, maybe the other question is, can you elaborate the difference between hair circumference and the BPD determination? Okay, so uh, hair circumference and the BPD measurement is, both of them measure the head, okay? And uh, it's, both of them are measured as a uh, transthalamic view, okay? So uh, maybe we can look at the transthalamic view. Okay, both of them as as a transthalamic view. Okay, this is a transthalamic view of the head, and both of them uses the same uh, setup. But the measurement difference is the bipartal diameter is as you know we do have two parietal bones. Okay, on our head. So from one parietal to the other parietal measurement diameter. This is a diameter. Okay, the bipartal is it's a diameter. Diameter is from one side to the other side. Their circumference is at the same side, it is the circumference of the head, okay? So in this head circumference, the difference is we use outside to the outside, okay? Out of the skin. But in case of BPD, we say we use from the uh, outside to the inside. Actually, um, from outside to the inside, outside also possible by setting our ultrasound machine. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, uh, I uh, responded to the easily uh, finding of the female. Okay, I say earlier. Okay, after we find the abdominal circumference. Okay, so this is uh, abdominal circumference. For example, okay, we come from the uh, chest. We go to the abdomen. We find the abdominal circumference, and we go down. We'll find the bladder, and we go down. We we'll find the sacrum and a sacrum then they will see um uh, presence of the femur okay okay femur will come okay when we go down there so we see on both sides you see femur then after looking both femur then you can take one of it and you can enlarge 
uh, you you maximize up to the coverage of the whole screen, then you measure. Uh, if uh, uh, I clearly responded, uh, it's like uh, like this one. You can uh, easily find the female. Okay. If you can do abdominal circumference, just you go down. Okay. So you from the abdomen go down, then you find the sacrum, and after sacrum you find the um, uh, the head of the femur. Then after that you you change the probe side. The, the, the side of the probe should be changed. Okay, you go uh, downward transversely. Then after finding the uh, female, you make it uh, oblique or the, uh, the sagittal. Okay. Uh, one question: reversal in diastolic flow or absent diastolic flow is sole sign of neurological fetal status decision for delivery. Uh, okay, so. Um, Yes, in diastolic flow absence or um, uh, is is um, one of the sign of fetal growth restriction. There are also other factors that can uh, cause this uh, absence or reverse in diastolic flow. That's a sign of um, narration of fetal status. Yes, is it a decision for delivery? Not solely. Okay, so we use other parameters to decide. For example, uh, if you find. Um, in the diastolic flow reversal at 24 weeks, okay, you may decide for uh, termination. But if you find at 31 weeks, you see other parameters. It's not the wholly, solely the absence of the diastolic flow. So what causes absence of the diastolic flow and other parameters? You go for uh, ductus venous um, flow, and then based on the diastolic flow, uh, ministerial artery, visceral uh, vasculitis, Peak system diversity, you decide based on that, okay? Yeah, the, I believe we addressed almost all of the questions. Uh, it was indeed a very great presentation that we had today, doctor. And on behalf of all, all our participants and uh, Loyal Ethiopia, thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule to present on our platform. And we hope to have you in the future with other topics as well. And thank you again. And uh, let me give you the chance if you have anything that you want to address at last. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. And thank you for your uh, uh, texts. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, doctor. And uh, good night. Good night. <laughs>